let's talk about this month. That's where we're at. For God has purposed us for in this season that he's looking to really unveil the gifting that he's placed inside of us. You know, those things that he stole, he stole away deep within himself. You know, so that, that the richness and the fullness thereof as it's, as it's shared and veiled will astound us. You know, uh, again, this month, this first fruits, every Rosh Kadesh, every new, new moon, every new month, we take them, we honor first fruits. No, first fruits, literally, is a principle of great significance. If we understand the fullness thereof, you know, I, I grew up and I didn't understand the fullness thereof, and I think it's one of the least understood uh, teachers that's taught within the body. But once we come to a fuller understanding and we see what God has placed within, this, within the realm of our access, it will truly amaze us. You know, this principle, again, is of great significance because, you know, it gets kind of blended when people start looking at all the offerings and things of this nature and giving stuff. And it's not about that. It's different from every other one. It stands alone in itself. You know, in its essence, it's, it's not like the tithes. It's not like just giving and offerings and stuff. This one, first fruits, it's very, very holy in its essence and carries tremendous power to bless you and your whole household. It's in the richness of this gift that as we step into the fullness and allow its exposure, God, just to kind of saturate our lives, we'll find out, we'll find the, the fullness of what God has meant in it. See, because this, this principle, this principle of first fruits is all about, the whole essence is all about honoring God with your heart. You know, I think that's what, that's what the whole essence of what it tries to teach us. It teaches us that, you know, that if your heart isn't in it, if you don't do it from the heart, then don't do it at all. Because God loves a cheerful giver. And God loves one who comes with him with a, uh, with a readily open heart to, before him. See, that's how come that, the scripture can really say, say something like this. He said, David was a man after God's own heart because it wasn't tied to what was allocated or what I must do. It was, it was it's tied within his heart where he gave his whole heart, the things he did, you know, that he wanted to do. Just like that, that, that scripture goes about and it says, uh, when God raised up David to make him king, and when David stood in the palace, especially as you come from a, from a sheepfold, you're not hiding in caves, you're not living in tents, you're not, you're not living in a, in, a, in a common hut as such, but when God raised him and placed him into kingship, it says when the, when the palace was built with all the cedar and all this magnificent, worthy of a king. So it says, David looked at that and he's seen the tabernacle itself still sitting in a tent. And he said his heart was just grieved. He said, he said here I'm sitting with all this and God's home is in the tent. And he says, I want to build God a house. I remember he shared with the prophet, the prophet looked at him and told him, he says, your heart is right. Your heart is direct. You're, just, you're doing it, not an obligation. God didn't direct you to do that. This is something that you want to give. He says, go ahead and do what you want. Do all that's in your heart. Do to the Lord. He said, as he started preparing all the stuff, and he was just, I mean, he had this, the elements say, he's going to start preparing this stuff. But he says, before this prophet can get out the door, he stopped and he started thinking, comes back to him and says that that you're not the man to do this. God says he's brought you up you're a man of war. But your seed, your son will, will do this. And they said this. But then God says something awesome right behind it. He told me and told him and says, but I tell you what, you have a desire to build me a home within your heart. You just want to give back. You want to give me. You want to give me all I, you have. And see, within David's earthly limited expression, he can just give him everything. You know, I used an example several times a while back when I spoke in terms of dandelions. I said, my daughter, which is very, very young, 
just a little bit older than Eden. She must have been about so big. And, and she wanted to bless her mom. She was outside playing. And she's seen all these dandelions all over the yard. And to her, they were beautiful flowers. To me and to her mom, they're just weeds. You know, we get rid of dandelions. But to Melissa at the time, they were beautiful flowers. So she picked up all the, she just picked up a whole handful of flowers. And she couldn't wait to get in the house to give them to her mom. She walks in the house and Anita's in the house laboring and she goes there, this is for you, mommy. And she's holding the dandelions up. And Nita responded because what she saw was she didn't see the dandelions. She didn't see the weeds. She saw her heart. That she wanted to bless her mom. So when she held the dandelions up to her mom, those was the richest thing that she could give her because she understood the spirit and the heart. David, in all of his earthly limitations, can build a building where God has created all the trees, created the ground, created the rock. He created everything. It's all his anyway. David says, in my expression, I'm going to build you a magnificent God throne. Say, is there a house on earth I can even live in? The heavens is my throne. And the earth is nothing but my footstool. But because he had purpose in his heart, with such a heart for God, God says, I will build you a house. And the house goes beyond buildings and, and wood. I'm looking into your seed. I'm looking into your generation. I'll give you life. And I'll give you that much more abundantly. I will build you a house. And when David understood the wealth of it, it wasn't so much about a castle or a palace, being in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem. It's, God says, because your heart is like this, I will show you a house. Because of the heart. Because of the first things. First fruits is all about the heart. It's about giving from the heart. It's about an expression from the heart. It's about giving back to God when you come before him with the first of all things. Not because it's been written and allocated or defined as this, this is the parameter that you should operate for. No, it's when the heart is wide open and you're just coming before him with your whole heart to honor him. That's first fruits. That's what God looks at and that's what he looks at his blessed with. That's how come I said, if you don't do it from the heart, then don't do it. Because you killed it right from the beginning. <laughs> First fruits is not a monetary thing, nor is it a, uh, a crop thing, nor is it, you know, people look at things. It's, these are elements, the earth is God's. But what he's looking at is the spirit and the heart in which it was done. So some people say, well, that was back, way back when they're agriculturally bound and they're about the fields. It's all his anyway. Who is the Lord of the harvest? It's all his. But there's a spiritual connotation that's stuck with it. That is raising, that is a blessing for God. See that? This first fruits principle, it predates even the Torah. People talk, well, in the Torah it says this, you know. You get so much for the tithe, and you know, on, on first fish you do this. And on, on, see, it's, it predates this. In fact, it's, it, it happened at the very beginning of creation. You know, I love that scripture that says, before Abraham was. Before Moshe and the Torah was, God is. And when Abel came before God to give to him his best, That, that defined the second term of giving in the scripture. God so gave. The first fruits. It wasn't something that was defined and was you know, shaped within the Torah. It predates Torah. It was there at the, at the form of creation. It's something that God placed in the earth, a principle, to allow us to truly be blessed and contain his wealth. Amen? So again, this is the month of first fruits. I looked over here and I seen Joanne walking in here. She's just so happy. She said that she was putting together this montage. If you look at the montage, she says, what's so special about it? What's so precious about it? She says, as I, start, as I was putting every picture down, she said, I just kept worshiping God. I start thinking, 
the richness of what he's put into my family, what he's done in my life, what he's done this and that. She said, I'm just trying to get back together. She walked in the house and she saw that I seen this. I said, so what's that? She said, that's my first fruits. She said, I'm going to God and I'm going to thank him for everything. <laughs> I'm thank you for what he's done to me and my family and to our lives. So if I look at you and I try and say, how much do you think that's worth? Prices. My God. <laughs> I can't give you 10 bucks. I can't give you $20. I can't give you $100. I can't give you $1,000. It's not even worth a million dollars. She says, each one is a story in a life in itself. It's priceless. It's an offering, first fruits to God. It's a principle that we literally fully embrace in this house. Amen? Amen. So let's step into the newness of this month. Let's just talk about this month and what it holds for us and how what God is doing in this time, for this, in this season, as he's looking to reach inside of us and start pulling forth the giftings and the callings and everything that he has for us. Huh. This month is a month of Nisan. Nisan gets its root in the word Nisim. Nisim, that word, its root word, it comes from, literally means miracles. So what does that tell us as we step into the season? If this steps into the season and we're getting an insight to each time, he's telling us that, you know, we should stand in this season as we move forth in this month with the, with the spirit of expectation, looking for God to interrupt the common and I elevate my mind to the uncommon. I need to think and be in expectation of what God is going to do in my life during this season. That word nisam also speaks in terms of redemption. It speaks of redemption, which is, this is the month of Pesach. This is the month of Passover. This is the month of the resurrection. This is the month when Yeshua came to redeem us. You know, that re the word redemption even speaks in terms of restoration. Those things that have been lost, those things in, my, in this period that I look back for and I can, and I can somewhat uh, be amiss because I'm thinking like, I blew that or I didn't do that or, you know, if I had done this, I could have been better or I could have done that. That's it. No, this is a season of miracles. This is a season of restoration. This is a season of redeeming and putting back into place. Things that were broken, things that were lost, things that were stolen. It's a season of restoration. You know, Nissan also takes on another name, which is called Abiv. We also see it as the word Abiv. And Abiv itself means spring or springtime. It speaks in terms fully of restoration, both in the natural and in the spiritual. You know, we said re resurrection. You, what are we talking about? You know, it's God is. This, uh, there's a big piece of what Yeshua was doing when He came uh, to redeem. Not only redeem us from the brokenness of a, a bondage, but also what He's doing in the spiritual. Another word for Aviv comes across in this word, and we see it as teshuva. It means return. We look outside, you know, I'm seeing all the snow and stuff, and I see, look, the grass looks all brown. Trees have no leaves on them. There's no greenery. That's not the fullness of what they are. They're all kind of dormant. They're all kind of uh, fell in a place to weather the storm, weather the winter. But during spring, we look up and we see life restored. We see the fullness and the color and the zest and the... We're looking for... Uh, an awakening, a return of the greenery. <laughs> this is the month, as we, as we prepare our hearts as we go through this season, this is the month that we, that we journey, specifically the month of uh, Passover, Pesach, in line. It's a month to be cleansed from anything that's held you in the old season. It's a month that we, we reflect back on our lives, look back and try and say, God, I got all this junk. I got all this stuff. I got all this guilt and condemnation in my mind. God, I'm so tired. I'm looking, I, I want to move someplace. I want to do something new. God, I need, I'm looking for a fresh start. I'm looking for 
an awakening. So in this season, so in this month, it's the month that we're cleaned of all those old things and are free to move forward. God wants to liberate you, get us freed up so that we can move forward in all that he has for us, all that he's prepared for us. God has a walk. He has a life. He has a destiny for us. <laughs> you know, Nissan, in this month, God has placed in this month, as we look at uh, Nissan and Adar and, you know, the various different months, there are cycles that have been placed within the earth. And God, is, we live in a, in, a, in a circular environment. And God's looking at these, these cycles that move within us to draw out our identities. Each month is unique into itself, but, but God has our personal identities that he's trying to draw out of us. You know, in my, in my, in my early days, probably before God started giving me this spiritual awakening, this, to awaken me up as to what they had me to be, I used to get, hung, I was hung up on January, February, March, April, May, June. I looked at our life, I looked at life almost linear. And I looked, you know, this, this time that was just going, I said, I cannot believe this 2000, you know, 17, 18, 19. I just, it's just like, life's going on, I'm getting older. But see, I it had the wrong perspective. It might bring, I had the wrong perspective. Because I didn't see what God had placed in my life and the seasons that he's placed within me that's taking me through, that's trying to pull those thoughts that inside me that have been buried so deep. I felt, you know, I can have negativity or people call me, you know, can talk about me or talk about what they perceive in me, but they couldn't see what God has placed all within me. And what God is doing during that time is just like an apple. I can see the seed. It's so small but until that seed is planted in the ground and it's gone, allowed to go through a cycle. I, I can't see how big a tree that is. I can't see how full a tree that is. I can't see how fruitful a tree that could be. I can see just a seed, and that's what people are seeing me when I was sitting in January, February, March, April, May, until I start getting into God's times, getting into God's cycle, so I can start understanding that he has placed a cyclical in, um, time frame within me, a cyclical, a cyclical environment around me with the newness of every month. It's bringing more things Every month being unique in itself, unfolding as I go through them. If I'm aware of what God is doing as he changes and migrates and pulls these things out of me so I can be shaped and grow and fulfill all that he has purposed me to be. Hmm. So this month, Nisan, it's the first month of the ecclesiastical year. What are you saying over in Exodus 12.1? This is where God interrupted time. See, when he went to redeem his people, bring them out of that bondage and out of that slavery. But there's a, there was a spirit in which he, he set that time as a picture and an example for our lives here in 2018. What he says, he says, there's a lot of us that have addictive habits. We can, we, we can be caught up in a lot of different types of bondages. It's more than just chains. It's more than just being cooped up. You know, outside there's invisible bondages that can hold us. Slaves and chains. You know, iniquity. Habitual things, whereas whether I'm hooked on stuff like, you know, whether it be the physical drug or it can be physical, you know, it can be, uh, I can become a workaholic. I can become uh, just things that just loop me, consume my time, consume me. That's just where you're just heavily laden that way or lean that way. He says, whatever has captured your heart and your mind, says, you become a slave of. But this is the month of the, of the classical year when God interrupted time. And he told Moshe at that point, he says, because typically Nisan would have been the seventh month on their typical calendar until God stepped in this time because he's going to do something great and says, mark this time now. This becomes the beginning of your months. I'm going to start doing something great right now. And you can mark this as number one. What they did, it took a seventh month and bumped it up to the first month. And when I bumped up to the first month, then he tried to say, mark this as the beginning because you're going to see some things I'm going to start right now. As I, as I, as I bumped that and I start right now, the seventh is still there. So on the, on the, on the they operate on two calendars, on the civil calendar, on the regular calendar, just like we look at January, February, March, they still look at a Nissan as being the seventh month. But on God's calendar, Nissan is number one because he's doing something new to them. 
in the spiritual realm. <laughs> this is also called the month of our salvation. Again, he's speaking in terms of not only natural, but physical. I mean spiritual, physical and spiritual. Breaking us from these natural bondages and things that, that can hold us, but also spiritually breaking us from everything that will interfere with our ascension. God is trying to elevate us. He's, t he's looking to take us to a higher thought, a higher understanding so that we can see what we truly are. You know, I love when we, when we get into, start talking about the, the newness of the month because Hebraically, I, uh, they made us be aware. If you look at the, at the, at the Hebrew, from a Hebrew perspective, from the Hebrew calendar, when they look at each month, what God has done, he's wrapped up not only his time as the, as the month itself, but every month, has a, has a stone or that's associated with it. Every month has a tribe and its characteristics that are associated with it. Every month has an alpha letter, a Hebrew letter that's, associated, that's attached and associated with it. And when you look at the various elements, whether it be the stone or it be the tribes or it be the uh, alpha, there's characteristics of each element that kind of gives you expressions as to what God is looking for and what God is going to unveil on you in that time. So as I look at this time, I can look at one thing that I know that's sure, that's true, is that for the month, the stone, for the month, a Nissan. The stone is a, a blue topaz. <laughs> and again, I look back and I, I, see, I can see what the gemologists, as they look into the characteristics of each stone, and they, would, and they have various different attributes that they, that they reflect. And so I, I look at those, I say those, I look at those and I try to say, okay, these are elements that God's looking for to awaken in my life as well. So, if, so like with the blue topaz he's talking about, it, it identifies or it has the character of faithfulness. I can't think of anybody that God would try to tell us today, he's looking for us to be faithful. God is faithful, he's awesome. The stone is also known for enhancing his prophetic sight. God tells us to be discerning. God tells us to look and look again this year, to be discerning of the elements that are around us and things that he's saying. I heard, again, I, I, I echo back what Nita's thought was when she placed it before the people, when she says, you should be able to see God in every situation. So if I'm discerning and I'm trying to be mindful, I'm trying to be looking, I don't want to be hung up on negativity. I don't want to be hung up and get lost in the weeds when I'm thinking, oh, woe is me at all times. I want to be able to see and be discerning of what God is doing in my life in this season. It says it's known for bringing a calmness, a soothingness of the emotions as well. <laughs> emotions can, can have you running every which way but loose. I need some way to kind of see that. So in that, I'm just saying these were, they look as attributes of the stone. I think, I think they're profound because I'm thinking, uh, I can see as they speak into my spirit, man, even it, as it relates to bringing forth healing. I don't know how many of you guys are, are, are allergic to being healed, but, uh, <laughs> but if I can use anything that can try to enhance or kind of guide me and help me in that regard, enlighten my heart. The tribe that's associated with this month of Nisan is the tribe of Judah. Judah's name means praise or the praise of God. <laughs> He's known as an apostolic leader, but leadership. What does that say to us? Apostolic means in terms of pioneering, of being uh, a creative in your leadership. God's looking at us for us, not just to, as you stand in line at this, as leaders of a home within our family, God is one who's governing a temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. God's looking for us. God, just to be, uh, not stagnant, but, but pioneering, forthright, moving forward. I love this one. When it says, Judah is also known as a warring tribe, gifted and sound. <laughs> Not sound, just screaming and yelling sound, but they said that he was known just like uh, to bring praise unto the heavens. I don't know how many of you guys know, know or understand, who created music? 
God, if all music and all sound, I mean, if he organized it, there has to be an element that, that, uh, that's attached with that. I understand like when, when Saul uh, was having fits of rage and losing his mind, the only thing that could bring peace, the only thing that could chase the demonic influence that was over him was the music. It went past words, it went past touch, it went past senses. That music that resonated in the atmosphere went inside of him and soothed him and chased out demons. There's, there's something about music that's when we step into the worship. You know, that music can go up and the spirit man can come alive. Judah was masters and gifted in their sound. You know, over in Genesis 49.9, it said, Genesis, it says, Judah was referred to as a lion. Why? Because of his strength, his, endear- his daring nature, an unconquerable nature. I like that word, unconquerable nature. I get tired of getting beat up all the time. I want to win some battles. I need to have the spirit to be able to conquer and to rule. It's alpha letter, the Hebrew letter that goes with this month is the letter hey. Hey means grace. It speaks in terms of grace. It also means in terms of, I say, look, look again. Another word that comes from grace is like, behold, to look, to see. It means revealing, bringing something out that's hidden. God's going to be revealing a lot of things to us this month. This month of awakening, this month of kinship, this month that he's stirring inside of us. He want, there's things that we need to see, to understand, as we develop and continue to grow in his presence. Each month, like a diamond. He brings these elements to us. You know, I love that word, hey, but we see it in Genesis 17. It shows like when Abraham and Sarai obeyed Yahweh, God. Not only were their names changed, but their boundaries were extended. As God changed the names, he inserted the letter hey within their, their names. Abraham was no longer, God told him, says, you're no longer going to be looked upon as just as an exalted father, but you're going to look at as a father of nations. Or Sarai, he says, he's not going to look at you upon as mockery or someone who's been mocked, but you're going to be royalty. You become a princess within the heavenly realm. I say, so be it, God. Speak over me. Change my name. Show me my original intent. Show me who you're having to be. Extend my boundaries. Extend my borders. God, during this time, this month, show me who I am. Reveal those things. Make me discerning so I can see what you bring before me to liberate me, to set me free. Amen? The title of today's study, as we just move forward, is Awakening from Above. Again, you know, I get so excited as we come into each, each new month, each new season, when I get into God's cycle, cycle and try to understand what he's doing to us. What is he speaking to us? I think each of them are incredible. Why would I feel that way so adamantly? Why do I speak so way, so firmly? <laughs> because I believe that all the ascension, they're meant to take us on an ascending journey. They're meant to take us higher into his presence, to draw our true identity. See, people don't know who I am or know who you are really, but God knows what, he, what you were when he, before he made you and stuck you in your mother's womb. There's someone inside me that, you know, that has been shaped for this world, for this earth, by brokenness. <laughs> I used to use the analogy when I said, I seen a passage in scripture that says, we're born in sin. We couldn't avoid that because of the original fall. Because of, of Adam and Eve, there's no way for me to pass from that womb to come into this area without bypassing. There's a sin nature inside me. There's things that inside me that war. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, those things I want to do, those things I don't do. 
But the things I don't want to do, those are the things, those are the things I seem like I'm doing. I'm fighting myself all the time and getting mad at myself. Who's going to save me from this body of this brokenness? That's what he says. God, the scripture says we were born in sin, but we're shaped in iniquity. And so, and now this to say, that made me understand it, the thought was, what was iniquity? Iniquity is like a, it's like a, a broken fault, a broken environment. For example, I used, to use ner- I used to use the example, iniquity is like a bruise in the skin. The skin isn't bruised, but it's wounded underneath. And you can see the bruise or you can feel the hurt. You don't see no open wound, it's not very obvious, but you're suffering pain. And what I see in that is like, when I came forth, God may have spoken and says, Matthew, you are going to be a tall, handsome, and virile man. You're going to walk with pride. You're going to walk with zest and zeal. I built you to be a spokesperson. I'm going to use you as an oracle. I'm going to use your ability to speak to bring me honor. That's in his thinking. He spoke me. I stepped into a world with that potential. But I came into a world with brokenness and sin all about me. No, I had nothing to do with, with you know, all the, the murder and the, and the prejudice and the thievery and the, and the just dislikes. There's things in the environment that, that you have nothing to do but you're shaped by those. So here I come out meant to be like this, and then I can have people attack me or say certain things to me, and it hurts. Who do you think you are? Look, you walk around all arrogant and stuff, and you, start, you find people kind of backing up, and you start to become a little bit more humble, and you, you're, you don't want to draw attention you know, to you. You kind of step outside the way. And <laughs> I remember I used examples. I said I stepped into a school system during the, during the height of a lot of the civil rights times when prejudice was really being brought to the surface strong. This was Martin Luther King, uh, Kennedy, and all the people, all the stuff that was there. I remember the teachers used to attack you. And uh, there was sometimes, you know, you find some great teachers, but there's some that had a seat in them. I remember this one came at me strong and kept come at me just like, you know, who do you think you are? You're not going to be this and you're going to be that. And, you're not nobody, you know, you, uh, and you find yourself not trying to confront. And you go to speak, and they're, they're telling you, you know, shut up and keep your mouth, keep your thoughts to yourself. And I'm not trying to be, be mean teachers, because I got some great teachers in my life, but there's certain people that can do things that can hinder the spirit. So that spirit that was pride, the, the spirit that, that held, that you would have self pride and you would walk, was being crushed, being chaped. So I'm no longer walking on such you're trying to avoid people and you don't want to talk too loud. You're trying to do things shaped in iniquity, shaped in brokenness. Shaped until, but that was not God's original intent. But God puts elements before us that can break us from that iniquitous patterns and get us back on track as to who we are so that I can be able to walk as he, as he, as he built me to be. I can be able to talk as he made me to be. He didn't have me walk around trying to be, be so hidden. And I, don't, I don't like this person because this person bullies me too much or this person laughs about me or, or I can't go in this job. You know, just things, things that would try to shape the gift that God had placed on the earth. But God is looking for me to stand and to walk with the assurance that he made me. He says, I know he knew the color that he put on me. He knew the texture of my hair. He knew the voice he had placed in me. He says, within all these elements, you are an integral piece. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you're an integral piece to fit into the whole, my whole system of the kingdom. I gifted you to be part of this generation because there's things inside you that you can bring that no one else can bring. The enemy will love to shut you down and keep your mouth shut so that you, so you, you can't even be able to see who you are. But God's goal is to look at you and he's not going to leave you there broken. His goal is to remove all the shame, the brokenness, and the nicholas ways so that that true identity, that who you are, and what he purposed and what he thought about from the beginning will be able to stand up in this generation and fulfill his destiny. 
So, each month has the elements, they're unique into themselves, has the element to do that. Why? Because God never intended for us just to stay stagnant, stuck like we are. He envisioned our lives to look like living water. God says, that's the way I look for you. Like living water. I look at your lives to be vibrant, to be alive. Lives that are refreshing, ever moving. Not stagnant, stale. Inhibited by brokenness. Each month, each Rosh Kadesh, are unique unto themselves. Each of them had characteristics within themselves where God and distinction has shaped them so that they can target our inner man to restore us to the true essence of who we're supposed to be. That's why I keep saying in this month, this is what he's, this is what he's looking at. In this month, this is what's being spoken. In this month, this is what's being revealed. In this month, God says, if you understand my cycle, this month, if you're aligned with my ways, this month, you're going to change. You're not going to be the same one that you were here last year. You're not going to be the same one that you were here the month before, but you are going to ascend and you're going to evolve and you're going to become all that God has purposed you to be as long as you stay aligned and stay into his system. That's what it's all about. Living waters, that's what God's looking at. <laughs> and see, the beauty of this, when I speak of that, I'm talking about being born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and being all that, the beauty of that is that before you were born, a very familiar passage of scripture. Before you're born, God declared a decree over you. For he is not a respected person. Just, just as he spoke with Jeremiah, he's speaking over our lives. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. See, I can stand there and says, you know, we always look and say, God, what am I here for? You know, I'm doing the same thing, so I'm saying about, about the same process. People talk about purpose and destinies and they use all these big fancy words, but God, I don't know who I am. I'm lost in all this stuff. But God trying to says, you were never intended to live outside me. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. He said, my plans for you are to prosper and not to harm you. He said, I'm not trying to burden you down. I'm not trying to give you a lot of heavy weights. But my plans are, are, are such as to give you a hope and a future. You know, that's the one thing that will cripple anybody. And that's one thing that's, that uh, bullies or terrorists or people that would try to do is if they're going to shape you to try to hold you. They'll put you in captivity, they put you in the area of bondage. Why? To remove your hope get you lost. You have nothing to live for. You have nothing that you can see. You have no hope that kill you within. And God says, I know I dwell within you. My plan was to give you hope. Why? For your future. That you may live and walk out all that I have purposed you to be. I know, I know. They may not know. People may not know, your mommy may not know, your dad may not know, your teachers may not know, your boss may not know, no one knows. But I know, I know the plans that I have for you. And I know what they are. So this month is a significant month on God's calendar. Nissan is a very significant month on God's calendar. This month focuses on three essential needs that he's trying to reveal for our ascension, for us to come fully aligned in these times. <laughs> the first function of this month is a month of repentance. And this month, leading up to Seder and Passover, and this month that's giving, this is the month of repentance. For now is the time to remove the leaven in your life. <laughs> what does he mean by that? He says, look back at your life. This is, this is the time now to remove those things, those sins. Sin plays a picture of, leaven plays a picture in the scripture for sin. So God says, now's the time to remove it. During this season, if you want great benefit from all of it, during this month, now's the time to remove it. What's he saying about that? He said, this is not about multitasking sin. You got things in mind, you're trying to say, I'll, I'll do a little bit of this and do a little bit of that. He says, no. 
Scripture says, lay aside every weight, every sin that's going to beset you. You don't need to keep in your life and try to figure out how you're going to organize and how you're going to manage it. Get rid of it. Well, you know, I'm very good. Hey, I can do this and do that. And I can, this is not about multitasking. Now is the season to remove it. To benefit from it. Another area that, that's going to focus on our lives is on redemption. See? And redemption it also speaks in terms of restoration. Of restoring that which was lost. He said this is a time to have generational blessings and res restored. And receive a new level of understanding. Generational blessings, you know, I look back at my family and I can see where our family can just be, have a mindset like a war trying to be good, trying to be great. Trying to, see, we have so many gifts in my family. We are so creative, uh, artistically, creatively, I mean, writing and cooking and baking and designing. I mean, we, we have a more family reunion or a Weaver family reunion and everything moving. Ain't no one coming to that place that don't have a unique gift. Now, when you look at them, you try and say, you look at them, each of them, you try and say, man, you should be, you should write a book. You should start this. You should start, you have your own company. You should do this you, because you can see the potential. But something's got a lead over it. And they can be complacent within that lead. Why? Because something's there trying to hold them in a bondage, limit them in their expression, get them. Captured in iniquitous ways. And God is looking to break all that damnable stuff off lives and free up a people that they can be expressive and full of all that he's placed within them. Specifically, I, I talk about my family. God said, this is, this is a time to have generational blessings restored. We have a lot of blessings that's been, placed, that, that's been prayed over our family. Prayed over us. And to receive, once I step into that, once I step into a full knowledge, I, get, I go into another level of authority. You know, I'm not going to walk around, you know, once you come into, you got those little stories where uh, the swan didn't know he's a swan or the eagle didn't know he's, a, he's living in a, in a chicken coop because he fell from a nest. Walking around like a chicken, not knowing he's an eagle. He was a bird of majestic order to fly in the heavens, not on the ground picking corn. You know, somehow he got distorted. He's got broken. <laughs> God has given you, see, when you step into that area of authority, that new area, is when you come into understanding of who you are, you walk different. You talk different. <laughs> you know, you don't have to walk around with a pauper. You don't have to come in through the back door. But you start walking as to who you are. I'm shaped, I'm built. Every king, every prince, and every princess are taught from birth when they come up. They said, we got to teach you because you're not a commoner. We got to teach you so that you can walk like royalty. No, the kid puts on his pants just like I do, but was placed inside his mindset is that you're a person of dignity and worth. Walk like it. Talk like it, look like it, act like it. You know, you see a little of that come out in you when you get ready for the prom. You know, you go, you go to school, you know, you get your cut offs and blue jeans and tennis shoes, and like, you know, you're out there hooping and stuff, and you, and you kind of walk like, you know, like, the, like you're in the, in the, around the hood, around your friends. But when prom time comes and they deck you out in that tuxedo, I get you some nice shoes, and you got the tux, you got the cummerbund, polished up, and all of a sudden you walk in, you don't walk in like this. Hey, how you doing? No, of course, your parents are fit differently. Everything, you walk in the room like this. How are you? Same guy. He's walking different. Why? I'm dressed different. I'm in a different environment. Everybody's like, woo, look at that. Matthew, is that you? Yes, it is me. <laughs> and you turn, and you look, and you share. Shoes all polished, and don't, oh, don't step on my shoes. I, I, I got these things all shined up. See, everything changed mentally. Everything changed. Clothe me, warm me. 
Say, come Monday, that stuck seals comes off, and all of a sudden you see him going, how you doing? You know, you're walking totally different. They teach you kings. Walk like royalty. You're not common. God's telling us, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? You're going to be sitting on thrones. You've been put on earth to have dominion. So as he's taking us through each of the month of each of the month and get, bringing the new identity out of us, he said, you have, made, you have been made to have the dominion. Walk like it. This is your place. So, redemption is one. Third thing you should stand in expectation of for this month is miracles. <laughs> miracles. We walk in expectation of interruptions of the normalcy. <laughs> you know, I just experienced that just this Friday, yesterday. Is that yesterday? God, it seemed like a week's time in important periods. We were waiting for, we were going to have a, a piece of furniture that was going to be delivered yesterday. And, and the weatherman starts saying, the weather's going to change up. It's supposed to be raining, sleety, snow. I want to think like, and the, little, little, and the delivery people says, they're going to deliver it. Right about between 11 and 1. This is when it all started. So I'm in another room where Nina and I both in anticipation of the delivery. And, uh, and I heard her, pray, heard her kind of praying in another room. All of a sudden she stopped and she says, no, we said, we need to pray on this. I said, she says, you know, I'm asking God, you know, about trying uh, to hold the weather because they got to carry this stuff outside. And she says, but you know, sometimes she said, when you do that, so we sit, talk about praying on it, but we talk like we're wishing. I wish God, I wish I hope it don't, I hope it don't rain, God. I pray, God, that you'll hold this rain. I, I, I just, he said, but you talk like you wish. You're not truly asking him. She said, we need to ask him. Ask God. I tell, I'm thinking, well, we prayed that. She said, no, we need to ask him. So we stopped and we just took, I took and I just did that. I said, Father, I said, you know what our desire is. You know that this, this, this peace is coming. I'm asking you. You're the God of the heavens. You're the God of the earth. You're the God of the elements. You can, you can control everything. God, I'm asking in your space that you hold the weather to allow our peace to be delivered. Just hold it. I'm not wishing, I'm asking you, Father, because you have all the capability of doing it. If you'll do that. I mean, we say, okay. I mean, it wasn't even 10 minutes later. This is a, we get a call from out. Need to pick the phone. Oh, they had a cancellation. They're going to deliver the piece early. Oh, not, we're expecting noon, one, you know. They're going to, be deli they're going to deliver it early. In fact, they'll be there in 15 minutes. This is all like about, what, I think it's before 10. About 10. So the weatherman has said the weather's going to change up between 11. They're supposed to deliver between 11 and 1. And so, and the, and the, and the weather's supposed to start doing all this sleeting and stuff like here, beginning about noon, 11 between 11 and carry on through the evening. So when they call up and says, yeah, we just got a cancellation. We'll be there in 10, we'll be there in about 15 minutes. I said, oh, it's still beautiful outside. Oh, this is great. I said, God, the people pulled up in the truck. Moved the furniture in the house, got it set in place. With that, this is wonderful. I mean, clear as a breeze. And they left. We sat at home talking, just talking, and all of a sudden we heard on the windows. You can hear it. <laughs> See, people chuckle at that and say, wow, that was a beautiful. I said, no, isn't that interesting? All this. But see, when we said we asked him. What do I mean in all that? I say, stand in expectation. This is the month of miracles. God can do anything for you. He can alter your facts. He can alter your situations. He can, you know, we look at each other throughout the whole day, the rest of the day, because we watch everything come up. Even to the point, of, last night, it was lightning and thundering, and I'm going down the street and slush all the street, and, you know, it says, but he says, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, you know, in my mind, when I ask him, I'm thinking about Joshua thing. Stop the sun, you know. But I asked him, it's in his hands. And God just thought real quickly. 
we'll just put it early. And so he interrupted, and we got our peace beautifully at his time. That says, in this month, we should stand and be in expectation of things like that. You know this word, uh, Nissan, from its Akkadian root, it also means move or to start. Move or to start. That's when it comes from its Akkadian root. What's, what's the saying? In essence, this month, God says, this is the month God inspires us with miracles and moves us to start anew. If I can start afresh, if I can, something needs to stir me, I don't want to be stagnant, to move me. This is also the month. A lot of things in this month, a special month. This is the month where the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, that God decreed that they set up this tabernacle in the wilderness. That's what we read about. And as he set up the tabernacle in the wilderness, he put everything in order. Every tribe was aligned specifically as to where they would be. Also in it, he had given Moshe and the craftsmen specific designs and elements that were needed in order to set up this tabernacle. As he breathed on some of the artisans in order for them to capture the, what he revealed to them from heaven. This is the month that everything was coming to all into place. And it wasn't until everything was aligned. It wasn't until everything was in order. It wasn't until when the fullness of all that expression took place, then, boom, God filled the temple. After everything was lined up in the way that he'll have it feel, you know what they say? When his Shekinah, when the Shekinah, his glory, fell from heaven, <laughs> they call that, that action the awakening from above. And that awakening from above, it speaks in terms of the fullness of his glory, where the physical and the spiritual rebirth intersect on earth, producing the fullness of his shalom. Something's got hit. When he came down, <laughs> that was an intersection of the natural and the spiritual and his fullness of God's peace and his glory manifesting on earth. Paul took that same analogy. <laughs> Paul took that same analogy uh, when he spoke in terms of us as the temple, not being the tabernacle, us being the temple, the permanent dwelling place of the tabernacle, which became the temple. But Paul used that same analogy when he looks at us and he tells us, but don't you know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you? Just as those priests, just as they had got themselves in line and put themselves in order, God is doing the same thing within us as he looks at us as a temple. God has created each of us like, just like that, like his temple. He had distinctly aligned us for his calling and shaped us for the ministry that he's, that he's put within us. That's priests. You know, he, he dealt with them priests in, in that early tabernacle, and they had to get things in order as to how to do this. The sacrifices and offerings and the incense. The tribes were aligned. Everyone was aligned. And God says, and when Paul used that analogy, as he looked at us in the same way, is that God has shaped us within ourselves to be aligned in that fashion. <laughs> what do I mean by that? He's looking at each of us as a family, each of us as a, rep as a represent representative of his gift on earth. Every family has a special gifting, unique unto itself. See, no one can do like Joanne, like you or Cynthia, Ingrid. Each of you have your own specific gift as you align yourselves within God's kingdom. Each of us have a fragrance, an odor, uh, an incense, a smell that, that's unique unto every family. God says you stand in as a sweet smelling fragrance that comes up before him with the openness of a heart. Each of our families. There's a musical gift, there's a sound that, that can only be uttered from us. You know, I think of that sound, maybe think in terms of, I'm out in the mall one time and I, and the mall was packed. 
This is over the holidays. Mom was packed. And as I was going down to, I was, you know, you got people everywhere. It kind of felt like what Yeshua said. Who touched me? People said, what do you mean who touched you? There's people everywhere. You try to go into the store, it's, it's just packed. <laughs> I, and I swore I heard I needed to call me. I thought she says, Matt. Just like that. It wasn't like, Matt. And because everyone, people were talking, she says, Matt. I stopped and I looked back. But she wasn't there. And I'm just looking. I said, I'm, I was going to say, yes, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where she's at. Because her voice was like, I need no other person in there. I knew her voice. She called me. And I think hey, that's what God does. When we go to pray, of all the billions of people on earth, he says, my sheep know my voice, and I know them. When he calls them, he speaks, he says, I hear everyone. This particular voice, the particular sound, each family has a sound, a fragrance, a gift. They bring their own particular fruit for that family. And God is looking for each of us to step into the fullness of what he called us to be. And as each family matures in him, it's, it is actually the uniqueness of his glory. For us, every piece that's been unlocked, God is speaking. As he watches us step into the fullness of who we are, God's original intent. Amen? So as we come out of this time and look at all that God's purpose for us in this hour, I think in terms of what he's looking for us in this month as it concludes. We stand in a redemptive time of this month. This is the month of thankfulness. We should stand fully in the thankfulness that God has given us to the one who did everything for us. He's thanked us. We thank him. We give him praise. We give him the glory. We exalt his name for he's worthy of all praise. This is the month full of his blessings in which we give him honor to who honor do. For he's worthy of all our praises. Amen? Amen. Amen.